number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number nine, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad the Fourth, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey, you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not gonna know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track, that was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now, I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really, I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass, and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number seven, party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now, lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready. They're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Kings like that actually existed. They were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus, they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like a zoo, you couldn't find a more romantic place. Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC. His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? 
No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like dude, not the time. <laughs> Number 5. George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word. Philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it. Yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kind of just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your Well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too, check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also, so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. 
Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye-opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. We are At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going with that. If not, use your noodle. I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day, and if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally, like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery, just standing there just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrenstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. At number 10, royal enemas. Apparently, back in the day, enemas were all the rage amongst the elite. It was believed that enemas were good for your health, so everyone was doing it to try and live a little longer than the rest of those commoners and peasants. One person who really just couldn't get enough enemas in his life was King Louis XIV. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. When I tell you this guy was obsessed, I'm not kidding. One year, Louis received 212 enemas in just the one year. And of course, he had to make his enemas a little jazzy and couldn't just use water like any other person. Oh no, my guy was using things like almond milk. His enemas were also sometimes scented with orange or rose and sometimes even colored just to make it a little more special. To get an idea of just how obsessed the elite were with receiving enemas, just think about the fact that a French duchess once received one during a court ball. The duchess was in the middle of having a conversation with Louis XIV and during this conversation, Conversation, one of her maids came over, snuck under her dress, and gave the Duchess an enema on the spot. Ew. These people were so weird. At number nine, Pampered Pony. I'm sure I can speak for most people when I say when you have a pet, you love and care for that thing like it is your child, right? Well, one Roman emperor might have taken that concept a little bit too far because saying that he was obsessed with his horse is an understatement. The Roman emperor known as Caligula had a horse named Incitatus. Caligula was a horse racing enthusiast, so Incitatus was his pride and joy, and not too many people were all that thrilled about it, to be honest. When I tell you this horse, was treated better than most people have ever been. I'm not kidding. The horse's stall was made out of marble, his manger was made out of ivory, and he was even fed oats flaked with gold. Caligula was also very adamant about his horse receiving a good and restful sleep before a race, and he was so serious about it that he made guards stand outside of the horse's stable to make sure that the horse remained undisturbed while it slept. This horse even had its own furniture. Like, what is he gonna do with it? He's a horse. Caligula was so fond of his horse that he even made it a priest and promised to make him consul, which was the lead position in the Roman government after the emperor, highly coveted by senators. This was the last straw for people because the emperor was putting his horse above his own people, so he was assassinated. 
Now before I carry on telling you guys about the wild and crazy things that Kings did back in the day, I would like to first ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe think about subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mumia Medicine. It's safe to say that medicine from the past is very different from modern times. These days we have pharmaceuticals to treat illnesses, but back in the days of old there were very different and quite questionable methods of treating ailments, and one of those methods included cannibalism. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was common practice for elites like priests, kings, and other nobles to consume remedies that included human bones, blood, and fat as medicine to treat ailments from headaches to epilepsy. And this practice was called mummia medicine. At first, it started with people using Egyptian mummies and skulls from Irish graves for use in medicine, as bones would be ground and used in different tinctures for various uses. But soon, other parts of the body started to be used. Human fat was later used to treat ailments on the outside of the body, and blood would be consumed as well as it was believed to contain the vitality of life. Several monarchs were known to use mummia medicine, like Charles II and William II of England, Francois I of France, and Christian IV of Denmark. At number 7, Kissing Sheets For thousands of years, monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies, and so they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed in the morning. They would kiss the pillows, sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning clothing too, so his clothes as well as his son's clothes were also tested for poison before getting dressed. At number 6, Eternal Youth I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to live forever. I am one of those people. I am afraid of dying, but I also want to see what humanity will look like many many years from now until the sun consumes the earth. Unfortunately, that's kind of impossible, at least for now, until we come up with some kind of way to make people live longer. But this idea of prolonging your life has been around for thousands of years, and one Chinese emperor was super obsessed with the idea, and really tried his best to live for at least another 10,000 years. Emperor Ying Zhang was obsessed with finding a magic elixir that would make him live longer, and he demanded that his subjects find this immortality elixir for him. Now, even though he brought a lot of prosperity to people during his rule, he never let go of his demand for immortality, and it put a lot of pressure on his underlings to find him something to help him live forever, but obviously that didn't happen. He was so concerned with his lifespan that he even brought magicians into his court. His obsession alienated him from his people, and after all of that effort trying to live longer, he died at the age of 49. At number 5, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. For all openeth pores of a man's body, maketh the venomous air to open, and for to infect the blood." End quote. So yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed, and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. At number 4, Prankster King You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her, and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patrons organizing brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it, and flogged. Why? 
I have an idea, but I don't wanna think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. This guy was really quite immature. At number three, saints in bed. I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people, I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number two, rat court-martial. There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court-martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to, quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me, but I'm, I'm not funny, I'll leave. Kicking off the list at number 10, must love licorice. Okay, we'll start off a little tame. Napoleon Bonaparte, the famous French emperor, the famous military leader from the 1800s. Napoleon Bonaparte was responsible for conquering a large part of Europe. Bet you didn't know he was obsessed with licorice though. Way too much, he would eat this all day, every day. Ugh, feels gross. Look, as somebody who can't stand licorice, I already feel bad for Josephine. Licorice breath at any time of the day coming your way? No, no thank you, I'll hard pass. Napoleon carried licorice around with him at all times. This guy ate so much of it, his teeth became stained. They turned black. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, it's black licorice too. Not the strawberry pull and peels, those are great. I'm talking about 1800s black licorice. It would come in lozenges. If somebody offered me a lozenge and it was black licorice, I'd call the police. Smack it out of their hands. Number nine, George IV. When it was time for King George III to pass on the crown, of course, next in line, heir to the throne, is his eldest son, also named George. What if you became king in 1820? Would you be noble? Would you do monologues in the sunset as you enriched your homeland? Kings like to do that a lot with their off oh, by the hair still. Or would you do what King George IV did and make horrible financial decisions every single day? The guy would just party all day as well. He would gamble every day, he would buy expensive stuff that he did not need, and on top of that, he would never do any of his royal duties. Guy wouldn't do his job. His father had to step in, classic. He figured the only way to settle all these new debts set in motion by George IV, in order to clear those up, George now has to marry his cousin, Caroline of Brunswick. The arranged marriage happened on April 8th, 1795, and what was supposed to be a happy day for all was a nightmare for all included. They hated each other as soon as they met. I mean, obviously, he was a fool. George got heavily intoxicated for the wedding. He was just hammered the entire time. And then nine months later, almost to the day, they had a child. And then right after that happened, they went their separate ways. So yeah, horribly unhealthy relationship. Once George became king in 1820, he then tried to divorce her. Like, what a fool, just let it go, let it all go. Let her go. Number eight, Filippo Maria Visconti. The Duke of Milan during the 14th century was at first Gian Maria Visconti, but after he was taken out, his brother, Filippo Maria Visconti, had to step up to the bat. 
As a ruler, Filippo was better. His brother had been cruel previously, hence the untimely departure. So this was a good move at first, so we thought. Now Filippo had to take over come 1412. Filippo was better than his brother on paper. He helped reorganize government finances. He got the silk industry up and running, which we love that. He ended up passing away of natural causes down the road, which is, you know, nothing like his brother. But while he was in power, he never showed his face to anybody, not even people close to him. He hid in his palace most of the time, and it was odd because he thought that he was ugly. That's why he hid his face. Kind of sad, right? Filippo hid his face, and maybe you feel bad for him now, right? Just a little bit. He died of natural causes, and he was alone all that time. Yeah, don't feel bad for him. This guy was horrible. He was jealous of his wife, Beatrice Lascaris de Tenda, because she was twice his age, twice as smart, and twice as powerful. So, Filippo had her taken out in a courtyard publicly September 13th, 1418. Yeah, he accused her of adultery just cause, cause he could and he had some suspicions in his dark room by himself hiding his face. History is ugly and sometimes it's literally ugly as well. Number seven, George the first. King George I, couple of Georges on this list, okay? Long before his British ruling days, George was in Germany. He was actually the elector there, and he'd been married before around 1682. Originally, he married Sophia Dorothea of Seal, but the entire time they were married, it was horrible. George would straight up bring other women home because he just felt like he could. Like, he, li he literally argued that he could, given his role. He's like, oh, I could have these women, and we could do all this in front of you? Of course, I'm this person of this. Like, no, you're a fool, you're a jerk, really. He would have numerous mistresses and he would purposely flaunt them. So Sophia thought, okay, if you can have numerous side hustles going on, I'll move on myself. So she began seeing a Swedish count. <laughs> okay. She began seeing Philip Christoph von Konigsmark. Now when George inevitably found out, he was violent at this point. He was upset. He divorced Sophia and then imprisoned her. Yeah, when he became king of Britain later on in 1714, she didn't come with him. Yeah, it's not just horrible with Sophia either. The Duke had also been taken out, sadly. His love for Sophia ended up getting him killed. What a mess. All these Georges are so messy. The worst. If your name's George, don't be a mess. Just be nice. Hit that thumbs up if you're a George. Change the game. Change the stats up. Number six, heir to the throne. Okay, I kicked off this list roasting Napoleon and his licorice choices, but of course, he's done much worse things than have bad breath and stained teeth. Napoleon's marriage to Josephine was first fueled by love and friendship, but things quickly changed. Marie Josephine Rose Tasher de la Pagerie was born in 1763. She had two children with her first husband, but that marriage was also not a happy time. They separated and Josephine met Napoleon in 1795. Napoleon at this point was married at the time and they had an affair and they were deeply in love, like actually in love. And Napoleon proposed to Josephine in 1796 and they married later that year. Two days after their wedding, Napoleon led the French army in Italy, and while he was gone, both of them ended up having affairs. So many affairs in this. Like, does love even exist? What the hell? 1804, Napoleon crowned himself and then crowned Josephine, proclaiming her empress. A few years passed, and after finding out Josephine couldn't bear any more children, Napoleon made a list of possible and eligible princesses. Just a list, and just left it out. Like, how, how awful is that? In November 1809, Josephine agreed to the divorce, and come 1821, Napoleon Bonaparte's final word on his deathbed was, Josephine. Yeah, a little darker than the licorice, just a tad. Number five, King Henry VIII. The second wife of King Henry VIII. She was found guilty of treason, and she had been charged with having relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Bolin. She had also apparently, apparently, had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close, I mean, they were really close. He was the groom of the stool. So they were close, and on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Hmm, I wonder why. This list will explain a few reasons. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish. Anne wasn't present when these events even went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I. So there's no way she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533, your honor. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill, May 1536. And then two days later, Anne joked about her own little neck before being taken out with the sword herself. Yeah, all dark. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial. Somebody had to get an old elm chest from the tower armory. How horrible is that? Number four, a bit better, 
Another one of King Henry VIII's wives, Anne of Cleves. Where do we even begin here? This one is, honestly, this one's pretty sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, King Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister and then come back and compare them. This is like the birth of Tinder. I'm not even joking. This is how he did it. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. Yeah, compared her to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site, write that in. I praiseth thou beauty, madam, to a silver dollar. A silver sea sand dollar shining in the moon. What, I don't know, just click it. Click send and see what happens. Then a treaty was signed, a few weeks later Anne arrived to England and Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like the portrait, apparently. How horrible is that? Ah, you look nothing like this Victorian painting. How dare you? It's 6 a.m. and you've been riding a horse for four weeks and you don't look like this Victorian painting? Shame. He tried to stop the wedding, but it was too late at that point, so they had to follow through. And on January 6, 1540, their marriage was official. You can't unswipe this marriage, rich boy. And later accepted the divorce gladly and then lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Number three, Christian the seventh. Christian, there's an ironic name for what I'm about to tell you. The prince that couldn't keep his hands out of his pants. I don't know how else to say it. Here we go. Christian the seventh of Denmark. He was, he was a young lad. He was spoiled. He was a little comfortable with his body, maybe too comfortable. And he would often just have his hands in his pants hanging out. He was like one of those, you know, rich king. He was kind of like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. He would just have his just sit back and like suck on candy and stuff and just, you know, fool around. I don't know, it was gross. Middle of dinner, this guy would pass around food to his family with those gross hands. He would alternate hands and pants to handing out food. What a little twerp. Now it's unknown, but historians believe maybe, just maybe, he was a tad mad. Who's to tell? Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Thanks. Go wash your hands. Twice. Number two, King Henry VIII, again. Of course, we have to talk about Henry VIII again, again. He's Pretty bad, not gonna lie. Henry VIII was king of England from 1509 to 1547. He's been married a handful of times, as we've heard by now, and all of them have went south. When Henry married Catherine, he was 49. She was a few years younger. She was actually a lot younger, classic 1500s, way too young. And when they got married, Henry was not the same as he was when they had met. He had received a nasty jousting wound, so now he was gravely overweight. He didn't do anything. He just laid around all day and complained. So Catherine, of course, just wanted some, you know, shred of a life and being again quite young, too young. She decided to look for love. Well, God forbid, God forbid you try and have a life in the 1500s because then the young queen was accused of having an affair and was publicly and horribly taken out in the courtyard. And finally coming in at number one, Henry II. The relationship between Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine is pretty memorable. It's memorable in all the wrong ways, of course. When they first met, things were good, dare I say, with both of them. They were both young and he was gonna be king. He was young, king, guy, young man who's gonna be king. And Eleanor, I mean, she was married, but once she got an annulment, their love was good. You know, their love was good and young and ready to be young king stuff. After the annulment in 1152, Henry and Eleanor tied the knot officially a couple weeks after. Love moves quickly, apparently. Henry started having affairs, because of course he did. At this point in his list, we're not gasping at affairs, sadly. But come 1173, Eleanor had convinced their sons to go against father. <sighs> yeah, Henry didn't take this well, and he had Eleanor locked up for 16 years. He had died, so after that point, she had resumed the royal roles, because at this point, those two boys had grown up and inherited the throne, Richard and John. But being locked up for that long, what a nightmare that relationship was entirely. I figured we'd end on a kind of tame one, one where she kind of came back and it was good. Kind of good, dare I say? I don't know. Kicking off the list at number 10, a goodnight kiss. We'll start off funny, okay? History can be funny sometimes, even when it's not meant to be, and it's meant to be completely serious, I can't help but read this information and laugh. Royals were sweating constantly about people trying to take them out, of course. I mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy stalked the queen over and over for years. Historically, these royals have been on the lookout for enemies, and the way that they prevent these attacks, yeah, sometimes it can be a little funny. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you heard about this weird position in the castle? What an odd job this is. A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned their ale, which is, you know, pretty lousy job there. Either having a good day or a bad day, no in between. But they also had a guy kiss the king's sheets every day, just 
We just kissed the entire bed. The king size, may I remind you, massive bed. King Henry VIII, this guy hired somebody to literally just go in, get snuggled up, and just make sure the king's bed wasn't poisoned. There's nothing on it that's gonna make the skin go all ouchy. But he would just get in his bed and just go to sleep for a bit. You are required to make the king's bed every morning, of course, and before he gets back in, you gotta get in and you gotta get in and kiss that bed, man. You gotta kiss that bed real good. Mwah, mwah. Let's go. Mwah. All right, time to clock out for the day. Mwah. One more for good luck. Clothes as well. That was touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure worn and touched. With It's so weird. Guy's wearing my clothes in my bed. No way. I'd rather get poisoned. Like, yo, take my jeans off. Who is that guy? Get back here. Like, imagine marrying that king, and it's like, oh, hang on, before we get snugged in, this guy has to go and kiss your sheets. She's like, ew, what? Why does my sheets smell like breath? Everything smells like breath. Number nine, enemas. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the household. This, yeah. Back in the olden days, ye olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Well, rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies. Specifically, King Louis XIV. Guy loved enemas. Just big old fan of enemas. It's believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. Thousands. It's a lot of, a lot of decimals. Decimals for enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. Like, guy, that's like 112 too much, I'd say. I don't know. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier, by using um, almond milk for the enemas. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out almond milk and you're like, oh no, not again, come on, Louis, please, I just ate. Number eight, no bathing in this house. Bathing in the olden days wasn't fully understood, if that makes any sense. Like in a medical book, in an official 16th century medical book, the medical advice was use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? What? What does it even mean? Why is every shred of medical knowledge always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century, a doctor would just be like, ah yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick and you'll be on your way. Like what? Do you have any halls? Help me. Help me, dude. No, I'm just mad. I just like, bro, I have pneumonia. I need, I need medicine. So of course they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. Of course. So King James IV, apparently this guy never took a bath in his life. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass lice to others just by being in the same room that he was earlier. So not at the same time, he would come in, do his king stuff, leave, and the lice would be like, Pew! and they would just wait in that room and get on someone else. That's so gross, that's horrible. Lice would emit off this man, like the, he's like the stinky kid from Charlie Brown with the stinky cloud. That's just like lice around this guy. <laughs> Margaret Tudor was married to King James. Yeah, must have loved the no bathing thing, eh? Oh, oh boy. Number seven, Queen Caroline. Queen Caroline, ba ba ba. She went out in a horrible way. We can't sing about her. History remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she went out. It was bad. It was actually written down in an epigram attributed to the 18th century poet Alexander Pope. Here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Again, it rhymes. Why do all the, why is everything rhyming? This is so awful. Who can be like, yeah, yeah, write that down, that's good, that's good, wait, wait, it does rhyme, that's good, that checks out. Rest in peace, my gosh, her husband, he was certainly no help at all. Caroline was previously married to George IV, and this guy locked her out of Westminster on coronation day. So yeah, she went out in a horrible way, but let's not forget the marriage that came beforehand. That wasn't pleasant either, nothing in this guy or this marriage was pleasant. Number six, Henry VIII. Of course he's back, he had six wives and it was pretty much entirely bad for all of them, yeah. It was the late 1400s. Henry took the throne in 1509. This guy was only 17 years old when all this madness began to unfold. Only days after the execution of Anne, who I mentioned on part one of this list, so days after he married his third wife, Jane Seymour. Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour's mothers were first cousins, so they were close, and during all of this, they, of course, went head to head more than once. Jane died shortly after giving birth to Edward VI on October 12th, 1537. I can't mention King Henry's wives and leave a couple out. This is just a history channel. We have to mention all of them, okay? Number five, George V. Turned out this guy loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much though, I'd say. It was almost distracting. It was taking up many hours of his day. Like, you know, focus on other things. Like say maybe, I don't know, the war. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everyone's trying to stay alive. George is just in the background like. <laughs> I 
Like all collections, they started at an early age. It's now at a point where it's just, you know, past impressive and borderline strange. Especially if you're a royal, like you're really going hard with this. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages, full of stamps. That's 20,000 pages full of stamps. That's a lot, way too many stamps. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather the King of Philately. That's the official term for collecting stamps. We're historians here, we have to make it official. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record. Ho ho, the most money ever spent on a stamp. This guy dropped like 220,000 on one single stamp. Somebody even asked a prince down the road if he had heard about the fool who had spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp. And he was proud, he was like, oh that fool? It was I. Number four. Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. Yeah, some princes collected stamps, others collect zoo animals. We're all different. Yeah, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and not bears, but orangutans. So good luck getting your eight hours. He also collected human artifacts, like body parts after they've been, you know, so that's, watch your step, I guess. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Watch out for the lion's tail. Careful, what a mess. He's quite important in history though, I guess. He supported the scientific revolution and he also poured tons of money into astrology, so next time you read your horoscope, remember it's Bones in the Jar Benny that's responsible for that one. And also, in case you're wondering, yeah, he didn't pay attention to any of his wives or anything like that. He was just, no, nope, jars for me, jars and animals, I'm all set. Number three, Don Carlos. Spanish crown prince, the guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Let's talk about him. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was, yeah, I want to say worse things, but he was just a really bad person. YouTube, he was just a bad guy. Now, it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter than the other. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him with these disabilities growing up and people often feel bad for him a little. To that, I say don't. Nah, don't do it. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad. Dude was fine. Philip II of Spain? Yeah, he would hurt a lot of people. He would hurt animals and people just for fun. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how the pair of boots looked. He made somebody eat boots. We're not gonna feel bad for him on Bumblebee today. That's not what we're gonna do. He was also set up to marry Queen Elizabeth of Valois, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours, she was like, no, that's not gonna happen, no way. So she married his father instead. That's what happens, that's what happens when you're in 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos. Mary, Queen of Scots, was one of them. Margaret of Valois, well, we know what happened with her, and Anna of Austria. But his mental conditions grew worse and it went south. Shocker. Number two, Heart of Glass. King Charles VI, once nicknamed the Beloved and then quickly nicknamed the Mad. What happened? After he became King of France in 1380, he would have these episodes, let's call them. He would believe he was made of glass and he didn't want anybody to touch him. He had this glass delusion, which was surprisingly not uncommon, believe it or not, for this time period. Believing you were made out of glass in some way, shape, or form, be it in your head, butt, shoulders, or back, really spiked around the mid 1400s. And Charles VI, AKA Charles the Mad, he wouldn't let anybody, not even his wife, near him at all. I'm not making fun of somebody for having a fear like that. I mean, most likely historians believe he was schizophrenic, so obviously I'm not ripping on that. But Alexandria of Bavaria, another royal who had this glass delusion, she too believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass, so she had to enter rooms sideways to avoid it shattering. I don't know what's going on with this glass delusion, but I'm glad it went away, I don't know. And finally, number one, King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians. So that should already tell you a good amount of this guy. George was another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his, you know, intimate side quests, if you know what I'm saying here, like all these other kings we've talked about. He was a bit busy being a stupid fool. This man was trying literally everything to get a woman to sleep with him. Although he was the king and he was already set up, he was like, nope, I'm gonna go and keep trying with strangers and random. And he would throw a tantrum if they said no, or he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get the girl. Like, you know what I'm saying? One of those kind of monsters. He would also keep uh, trophies, lack of a better term, of all these conquests afterwards. He would ask each people that he slept with for a little piece of hair and then he would would keep them, he would like store them. Back then it was kind of common, I guess, for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, weirdly enough, because you don't have phone numbers or like any sort of way to remember someone, photos, I don't know. So you kept their hair. But after the king died, his brother found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. So yeah, I'll leave you on that note. I think there's a hair in my mouth, that's kind of gross. Number 10, what a drag. Bachelor number one, 
What would you do if I refused to marry you? Well, I would probably get quite violent and lead to the destruction of 10,000 lives at the Battle of Hastings. Might just drag you around by your hair and see where the night goes. William I, or more appropriate, William the Conqueror, was a fierce warrior and the first Norman King of England. Being the illegitimate child he was to the throne, some people didn't exactly respect the power moves old Willie was making. People rebelled, and he crushed them. Oh, and there was this one time that he fancied a woman named Matilda. Being the respected woman that she was, she declined Willie's advances. Willie, not taking no for an answer, promptly dragged her around by the hair until she agreed to marry him. Gee, what a, what a swell guy. Number 9. Let them eat cake. France had seen better days in the 1790s. People were starving, the economy was bust, and for some reason the poor citizens were being taxed the most. When cries were made from the people, they demanded that change be made. King Louis XVI being the great leader he was, he listened to the people and there was no problem ever again. Oh wait, he did nothing and the country had a bloody revolution. The man supposed to be leading his people failed to act. In fact, he did less than nothing, often trying to silence the riots by force. But when people are very hungry, and you're living fat with high society, you can lose your head in all that chaos. While the famous quote, let them eat cake, may not have actually been said, it's a good reminder of the disconnect between the upper class and poor. Leaving your people to starve isn't the best idea if you want to be a king for a long time. Number 8. Cash back. King George III had a simple ask of the American colonies. Right then, we just saved you all from the French and Indians, so now it's time to do the right thing and pick up the bill. Britain introduced new taxes on the colonies in order to pay back what it had spent on the previous war. But in reality, he was asking the colonies to pay up without much in return. Basically, I'm the king, I saved your skins, give me more money, which most people at the time couldn't afford. And I'm still gonna boss you around. The British Empire may have been victorious, but it was the colonists who felt all the effects of the war and the economy. This happened multiple times before some patriots had had enough and decided to act. And what he did when the people he was forcing to give money spilt a little tea? Well, he sent British troops for a semi-friendly military occupation. I hate to loan this guy a nickel. Number 7. Terrible Ivan He wasn't called Ivan the very friendly and generous and would for sure never cause any harm to anyone ever. He was Ivan the Terrible, and for good reason. His actions are very unholy. Let's start with the fact that he killed his son's pregnant wife. And when his son came to confront dear old dad, his son was struck with a pointed staff, killing him in a fit of rage. A legend tells us that once St. Basil's Cathedral was finished construction, he was so pleased with the architect to reward him for such magnificent work, Ivan gouged his eyes out so that no one would ever design something so beautiful again. His paranoia also caused the slaughter of Novgorod, where after he was done claiming thousands of lives, he burned all the fields just for good measure. Wouldn't want all those dead people farming without your permission. Should we tell them about the other world monuments? Number 6. Off with her head! Henry VIII is more well known for how he treated his wives more than his leadership. With a reign of over 20 years, the man had a few wives. Two of his wives were executed for ridiculous reasons, another was divorced. Turns out, actually, the church wouldn't grant that divorce he was looking for. So Henry went and did the next best thing. He broke away from the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries, taking their wealth and redistributing it as he saw fit. Nothing is unholier than trying to get away from the church. Historians believe that his divorce actually led to the English Reformation. Number 5. Nothing Left Alexander the Great was an excellent warrior for his time. Having conquered so much at a young age is really quite impressive. His empire stretched from Greece all the way to India. For a history class or a good book, this is fine, but in reality, he was a conqueror. The places he was marching into weren't exactly happy to have spear-wheeling visitors. He laid siege on multiple cities, executed those who defied him, and sold people into YouTube's least favorite S-word. Just about checks off everything a guy needs to be considered a tyrant. History remembers his conquest, but I am for sure will not forget how brutal conquerors can really be. Number 4. Chop Chop While Maximilian Robespierre was not a king in the monarch sense, he did hold a lot of political power in France when the political climate was quite messy. Plus, France was at war. But even messier than that is the way he dealt with citizens who were deemed anti-revolution by sending them to the guillotine. Within a one year period, he sent 17,000 people to their dooms via the National Razor, or as it became to be known. He even began practicing deism, something he called the cult of the supreme being. And if you know your history, you know that you can't get away with that forever. And with some sweet poetic justice, Rosepierre was sentenced to the guillotine. Number 3. All My Friends Are Dead Usually when people expire, the human thing to do is bury said lifeless human. 
It's just what we do. But apparently Ferdinand I of Naples did not get that memo, instead taking a page from Night at the Museum. No, this is not a cute comedy movie starring Ben Stiller, but in reality a complete horrifying nightmare. Ferdinand took the saying, keep your enemies close, a little too literally, as his favorite form of punishment was to mummify his enemies. Which let's face it, if he's a king, there's gonna be plenty. And he would like to display these mummies in what's probably the coolest place to be if you're into that weird goth stuff. He did keep some alive in the dungeon, but he much preferred his guests embalmed, where he would have them dressed up on display, just as they were before making the mistake of crossing Ferdinand. Now, what's the point of having that hardcore collection if you're not going to show it off? Well, he did. To the people he suspected of treason, which in a place like that, treason leaves your mind pretty quick. Number 2. Average Height for the Time Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military strategists of his time, maybe of all time. With full support of the French army, Napoleon found himself earning gallant victories one after another, all being accomplished at a very young age. However, after years of grand success in multiple wars and kicking a lot of imperial butt, it started to go to his head. Shortly after the coup that overthrew Robespierre, Napoleon had gained enough support to claim himself as the Emperor of France. With said power, dissolved the freedom of press, reduced the rights of women, and oh yeah, he was at war with most of Europe for years to come. While his military victories cannot be understated, his rise as a tyrannical dictator makes him very unholy. Number 1. Dracula There's been a lot of unholy things said here today, but old Vladdy takes the cake. What he lacked in land and power, he made up for in his brutality. As the legends go, Vlad was creative in his punishments, and was well noted for his human art pieces. And by art, I mean impaling his enemy on pikes, sometimes through their rear ends, and leaving them as warnings for anyone who dared cross him. Similar to the time, visiting envoys wouldn't remove their hats as it is to do in tradition, so Vlad had their hats nailed to their skulls, so that they may never remove them. There are a few other stories that are just too hot for YouTube, but I think he's a textbook example of unholy. He may also be the inspiration for Dracula. Imagine being that much of a monster one is created in your likeness. I mean, just looking at the painting of this guy, creeps me out, man. Whoa! Number 10. No one's ever really gone. You may have heard that said when losing a family member, a pet, or in the worst Star Wars movies ever made. Sorry, not sorry Disney, those are terrible. But perhaps there is someone who is never really gone. Kangas Khan. Yes, that's right. The ruthless Mongol warrior who conquered so much in his time that we're still talking about it today. So why is this big bad warrior still with us today? Well, that's because of DNA. Yeah, in his time there was uh, lots of activities going on, besides the usual pillaging the village and unaliving those who oppose you. There were a lot of happy endings, let's say, and by that I mean forced non-YouTube friendly conduct bedroom happy ending. So much so that when a study was conducted back in 2003, 8% of men in Asia were thought to be descendants of the mighty man himself. 0.5% worldwide. That doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking about millions of people here. Next time you go out, you may be brushing shoulders with the warrior's kin. Prepare for battle! Number 9. Henry again? Boy, it's really hard not to talk about this guy, but dude was kinda down bad for it. He's just most well known for his mistreatment of his wives, and by mistreatment, I don't mean getting into a fight over whether or not the toilet seat should be up or down, and then having a very toxic argument in front of family members. No, because when Henry was upset with marriage, he wanted divorce, which honestly was kind of taboo for the time. Oh yeah, and he also beheaded two of his wives because... That's how it goes. I know every couple has their issues to work out, but for most dads out there, having sun-drenched beer fueled weekends, they never go beheading after that. Although, dad's been staring at the lawnmower for a while and there's a lot of blades on that. I don't... Dad? While it is true King Henry VIII did behead two wives, he didn't do it to all of them. And at some points were honestly quite pleased with his holy sanctity of marriage. Anyone who's ever been married can tell you how peaceful and sacred that bond really is. Number 8. The People's Princess Okay, I know Prince Charles isn't exactly a king, but he is royalty and the man kinda did Diana dirty. That's a quick and half put together allusion to a Michael Jackson song for the English majors and the audience. Being royalty isn't easy. Being royalty in a modern age when paparazzi overwhelm you with lights and cameras just for a juicy piece of gossip like, when was your last bowel movement? Is it slow? Extra extra, read all about it, the princess is constipated. 
That's just not fun. So after Prince Charles and Princess Diana had been married for a few years, you can understand how excited the media was to find out about their marital disputes. There was three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded, was a quote by Princess Diana that gave the media a field day. Sadly, Prince Charles was having an affair, and it wouldn't be too much longer that Diana would perish in a car accident that may or may not be organized by the royal family themselves. Number 7. Midlife Crisis this one's kind of generalized because if I didn't, I'd have to mention almost every king ever. So here we go. Back in ye olde times, the access to better healthcare just wasn't there. Doctors aren't washing hands. Imagine, buddy eats some greasy mutton and then says, all right, time for your enema. But those aren't the only greasy hands around certain orifices I'm talking about. I'm talking about kings marrying older girls at the ripe age of 12. Yep, that's right. Nothing says experience in womanhood like being 12. People didn't live long, and oftentimes these arranged marriages had ulterior motives, like alliances or business, really. However, that does not make up for marrying a 12 year old who may or may not have started those super weird changing times, like when you were 12 and now there's hair showing up in places that you didn't know there could be hair. I sent a courier to the chief, and he came back with this message It ain't it. Number 6. Till death do us part Love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage, but sometimes the crooning words of Frank Sinatra aren't enough to keep people in love. Sometimes marriages end up like the ones we see on sitcoms, but when there's no laugh track, it's not very funny, and sometimes divorce is the answer. Uh? Medieval Germans thought this too, and something they practiced was divorce by combat. Basically the man goes into a hole with his arm tied behind his back and the woman is free to move around with a sack of rocks. These proceedings are strange as I'm sure no husband or wife married today would ever get so frustrated with one another that they would want to hit one another on the head with rocks. Oh the blessings of being married. Number 5. Domestic Disturbance William the Conqueror was one down bad dude. The illegitimate ruler to the throne left a bad taste in some people's mouths, and was just as ruthless in silencing those rebellions that were always uprising against him as he was with the famous battles he was a part of, like the Battle of Hastings. But what I think he should be remembered by is the way he asked Matilda to marry him, or rather the extreme measures he took when she refused his advances because he was an illegitimate leader. William dragged Matilda by the hair out into the middle of the street and beat her until she agreed to marry him. I don't have to tell you how messed up that is, and I sure hope I don't. Number 4. Nero Sauna The Romans were kind of a big deal, especially if you're into history. Large city, culture, and some other structures are still around today. That's kind of cool. But while the city of Rome may have been the best city on earth at the time, Romans themselves could use a little work. Meet Emperor Nero, the vicious leader of Rome who became emperor through ill-gotten gains. However, in what may have been one of the first acts of flexing the male patriarchy, the divorce or forced separation of his wife Claudia Octavia comes to mind. It was a rocky marriage from the start. There was a general dislike from the very beginning, but when Nero remarried as emperors did, he had Octavia banished to an island, where shortly after she would be suffocated in a hot vapor bath. Her demise was sad for most Romans. Oh yeah, and they tried to make it look like she did herself in. That's messed up, man. Number 3. Pedestal I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal sometimes. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous. A promising athlete. I really enjoys collecting stamps. You go little rock star, collect those presidential stamps. However, Emperor Caligula of Rome had some other ideas. He would literally put his wife, who he claimed to love, up on a pedestal stark naked and let his friends in the military gawk and glare at her. He would also say to her that he could end her life whenever he wanted and put a knife against her for no reason. Weird flex, but okay. This guy was awful to everyone as he tormented and unalived so many people. Well, you sure wouldn't want to see his face everywhere as he liked to do just that. Built statues of himself everywhere because after losing your family to his tyranny and looking at his wife, you need to know who's responsible for all this. That's messed up. Number 2. Doozong 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 That wouldn't really be a great fraternity name, would it? Well, the Emperor of Doozong of China would think differently as when he was in charge, that's pretty much what the royal court looked like. Enough drinking to keep AA in meetings for 100 years, and enough ladies of the evening to 
Well, I don't have a joke for this one, but there were a lot of them, trust me. Having massive parties like that and enjoying the company of other women is not how you respect your wife. To make matters worse, it seemed that too much partying may have been a bad thing. Who would have thought? As what he made up for in a fun weekend he lacked in governing, as the Mongols were at his front door, or gate rather. Eventually, his empire would burn to the ground. All thanks to Al. Alcohol. And many women who laid down for their lives, literally. Number one, side piece. Look, I enjoy the company of a woman just as much as the next king sits on his throne. But in my opinion, once you find a wife, it's time to settle down, relax. No more crazy parties like Duzong. This is another generalization, but every king did this. Every king in the past has had mistresses. As if that is a totally okay thing to do to your wife and oftentimes the queen of your kingdom. I'm a reasonable guy, so maybe I can see having your side piece waiting in the wings to be stage center, but it's never one, is it? It's always multiple. Ladies of the past, all I can say is make sure you give birth to a boy and watch your back. They're coming for you. Number 10. What's yours is mine. Maintaining a dynasty and trying to rule over a people is hard. Many people have done it in the past, but if you notice, there isn't that many kingdoms left. So, it's no surprise that in Egypt, one of the largest and most successful civilizations of the ancient world and of all time, had some political strife. Berenice III had lost her husband, Ptolemy, and she was doing her best to maintain power. In some serious Alabama energy, Ptolemy XI was made king, a stepson and half-brother. The man wanted it all to himself. And can you blame him? I mean, look at the pyramids. Nice. I'd want him too. He promptly unalived his new queen because power moves. Some people didn't like this. And in some form of poetic justice, he was unalived by the people. What's the lesson in this one? Maybe that you can't trust your strange, closely knit inbred family members? I'm not sure, honestly, but it's, it's just messed up. Number nine, double trouble. This one isn't exactly about a king removing a queen like his wife, but it is about kings ceasing the life of their queen, more specifically their mother. Clericus and Oxythrus were the sons of Amistris, a woman handed off in marriage by the mad lad Macedonian himself, Alexander the Great. Well, like a lot of ye olde history, there was some power struggles. A power vacuum had been created in the death of Dionysus. You'd think that wouldn't happen over and over again, but You'll find that a lot in history. The power struggle was solved and eventually Amistris retired and remarried. Named a town after herself. Things were okay for Amistris. Things were good. But one day her sons came to visit and noticed the mom looked a little thirsty. So they drowned her in a river in a power grab that pretty much immediately backfired as they too were unalived by the next guy in line. Pretty similar to the last story, but that's history, isn't it? Number eight, one too many. Sometimes when you're king, you're gonna have more than one wife that's six feet under. It's just how it goes sometimes. However, I believe there is no better example of this than Afzal Khan, whose actions were so egregious that I did a literal double take after learning about what this king had done. See, Afzal didn't just unalive one wife or a couple like history's favorite King Henry VIII. No, 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 my busy bees. He is responsible for the termination of 63 wives. Not wives. I'm, I'm not sure what kind of guy would make that kind of mistake. <laughs> In fear of losing them to an invader who treated women slightly better, he had his soldiers give them a tall glass of drowning. Those who tried to escape were cut down without mercy. Yeah, I lived next door to the chief. He invited me in for a cup of tea. I sat down and he said, that ain't it. You know something's messed up if I'm overusing that joke. Number seven, 20 years of therapy. Elizabeth of Bosnia was a very unpopular queen and unfortunately had to often defend her throne with violence. As it turns out, this did not bode well. Many people wanted revenge, and honestly, just to take her position of power. Elizabeth, understanding perhaps her times might be numbered, was going to try everything she could to keep her bloodline in power. The passing of her king husband only made things worse. In her attempts to escape the impending doom, she was captured and imprisoned by her new owners. She was eventually released. Oh, did I say released? I meant as punishment, she was strangled in front of her daughter. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm more of a bumbling fool, but that just can't be healthy for you. Emotional damage. Number six, bad divorce. 
Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with a fellow kingdom or with a bigger one itself. Pedro of Castile, he married a young Blanche of Bourbon so France and Spain could just seem just a wee bit more snug. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower. Just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince wasn't coming to rescue this damsel in distress, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe as Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just awful really. I mean, imagine being locked up in a tower for a long time. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get a food delivery app up in that tower? Maybe. Number five, women's rights. Listen, it would be difficult to talk about this list without bringing it up. And ladies, all I want you to know is that you're gorgeous and I love you. But queens of the past, although they might be royalty, were severely lacking in rights. This is a time when men ruled, literally. And unfortunately, that means a lot of women got the raw end of the deal. Just as an example, women have only been able to vote in the United States since 1920. There was a lot of work that had to be done, which sounds like a long time, but it really isn't. Women of the past, and especially the medieval world, basically needed a man to walk through their life, whether they liked it or not. Can't own property, business, can't sign contracts, basically everything they need to do has to go through their husbands first. Sure, royals had it easier, but I'd argue if someone could just unalive you or lock you away in a tower without consequence, do you really have rights at all to begin with? I don't know, I don't think so, that's not right. We're gonna do better, we'll do better. Number four. Herod the Not So Great. Herod the Great was the king of Judea in 37 BC. Herod the Great was also a monster. I know I've given Henry VIII grief for Anne Boleyn, but buddy here, he just throws out wives like it's his business. Uh, well, it kind of was, actually. He, he was a busy man, having an estimated 14 children with different wives. There's also a good chance that there was more, uh, being since that female births were just not recorded. He also unalived a lot of other people, too. Th th this guy was just so much of a tyrant that both Jewish and Christian faiths depict him as a tyrant. Way to go, dude. Nice. Number three, the mayor's alibi. All right, here's a modern one for you. Yes, I know the mayor is not a king. I understand that. But they still hold a decent amount of power, and this happened in the 90s, which I hate to bring up because that was a really long time ago. Yeah, I know, right? I know, I remember that too. Mayor Barry Waite and his wife were just as comfy as peas and carrots when one day his wife was mysteriously unalived. Barry was not a suspect at first, but slowly as time went on, his alibi began to unravel, and he seemed less and less trustworthy. As multiple financial-based scandals were beginning to rear their heads, it later became understood that his wife was going to seek legal aid after learning about Barry's doings, strangling her in a fit of rage. Years later, he was convicted and sentenced to 40 years in prison. So maybe we haven't learned much from our historical past. A man in power in fear of losing it to a woman has removed her from the equation. I guess we'll never change. Number two, one last ride. King Philip V was down bad. The CEO of Naughty Time. This man liked to get down and to be a certain kind of dirty. He could not get enough of women. He loved them, his wives and mistresses included. Reported to try and get the deed done at least three times a day. Now you might be saying to yourself, but Big Chet, what's so wrong with that? Everyone likes a little mooey mooey once in a while. Hey, I hear you. A little toe curling once in a while, it's a great thing if you catch my drift. But Philip may have enjoyed it just a little too much, as when his beloved wife was on her deathbed, he tried to squeeze in one more D appointment. Your wife is dying and all you can think about is a little afternoon delight? A bouquet of flowers and I love you would have been fine, but who am I to judge? You, you go ahead. Weirdo. Number one, the last czar. Nicholas II of the Romanovs was the last czar of Russia. What did he do to his wife? Well, not much, actually, and, and that's the issue at hand. It's his inaction that hurt her and the family the most. You see, Russia was an interesting nation in the early 1900s. As most nations were modernizing, Russia was still somewhat stuck in the past. A lack of rights for anyone, no industry, and the monarch was kind of oppressive. Well, Nicholas the Tsar was going to change it. At some point, maybe. 
Uh, okay, well he didn't. It would take a whole history class to break down what actually happened during those crucial years, but in a nutshell there was this new fun idea called communism. And with the lack of the czar's support to the people, uh, this is serious neglect we're talking about here, the people revolted. The monarchy was overthrown and in an event that's actually quite sad, the czar and his whole family were unalived by the new government. His inaction got his wife done in. Way to go, Nikki.